Hi everyone, welcome to Hydroponics for the Hobby Grower. Um, this is, I believe, the sixth um, class in this, um, the sixth workshop in this entire class section. Um, I am Casey Hummeldorf. I'm I'm a Girl Scout um, who's helped set up with um, with the library and with. Um, Prince William Master Gardeners to give, give the community resources on how to garden and give them a gardening box to share. Um, more so a seed box, but still just a place to share their seeds, share their knowledge. Um, Valerie, if you would like to talk more about the seed box and about um, the Manassas Park Library in general. Sure. Well, um, I'm Valerie. I work at the Manassas Park City Library. We were really excited when Kesey approached us for her Girl Scout project. Um, and given our location um, in Blooms Park and our uh, personal affinity for nature and gardening, we were super excited to partner with her to bring both the seed exchange um, which is our uh, leave a seed, take a seed, um, free little library box out behind the library, um, and to bring these uh, guard this gardening workshop series to um, the community as well. So I personally have worked at the Norfolk Botanical Garden and um, am a member of the uh, Council of Botanical and Horticultural Libraries here on the Eastern Coast. So real excited to uh, be partnering with Casey and to bring our love of gardening to everybody here in Manassas Park. Okay, overview of the workshop and rules. Um, we just did our introduction. We're going to watch the hydroponics for hobby grower gardening video um, provided by the VCE Master Gardeners. That's going to take around 52 minutes, give or take. Um, final remarks and then Q&A closing, um, rules and discussions, please keep me you know, doing videos, put your questions in chat, um, no spamming in chat, I know that's um, a weird rule, but I've worked with low kids before and it's, I just feel like I need to put that out there. Um, sessions will be recorded and uploaded onto YouTube, um, if you don't feel comfortable with, with being recorded, you are free to leave, um, we are very thankful that you're here. And yeah, so hydroponics for the hard, for the hobby gardener. Um, this video was provided again by the Prince William Master Gardeners. So big thank you to them. Okay, so what is hydro? Uh, let me make sure I'm sharing my sound. Uh, share sound. Hydroponics, it's basically growing plants without soil. And usually it's done in a greenhouse. Um, and you can do this in backyard greenhouses. We have a master gardener who, before she moved, had a greenhouse in her backyard and she was doing hydroponics there. For the home grower, a lot of times it's, it's easier really to do it indoors with grow lights. And you've got some pictures here of, of various greenhouse operations, but down here in the lower right corner, in what looks like a huge warehouse, that's really what it is. This is in New Jersey. Uh, I forget the name of the company, but they're doing hydroponics in an old warehouse and they're just doing it at a massive production level. So you can do it small scale, you can do it large scale, you can do it indoors, you can do it in a greenhouse. And so why do we grow hydroponically? Well, one of the advantages is that we have better control of the inputs. We have better control of the environmental inputs in terms of, especially if you're growing it inside, you have much more control over temperature, humidity. Um, we also have better control over what nutrients are going into the plants. We're generally using less water. Typically with hydroponics, you have higher yields, you have higher production density, so you can get more plants in a smaller area, so it's good for a small space. Once you get your system rolling, you tend to have more harvest per year, and you end up with a generally cleaner product because you're not fooling with soil. There are some disadvantages. The big one um, is for a lot of people, the technical learning curve is, it really depends on the system, I should say, but um, you can do it very simply, but you can also do it very complicated. 
And so there is a bit of a technical learning curve with that. It does require more management. And again, depending on what system you're using, uh, capital investment might be a little more than your backyard grower really wants to put down. It's a sort of cost return sort of thing. You can spend a lot of money on hydroponics. May not be worth it for what you get back on the small scale, but you can also spend not so much money and have a more basic system and have a rewarding hobby growing vegetables without soil. So how do we use it? A lot of vegetables are done in greenhouses, uh, both at large and small scale. We have a lot of greenhouse floriculture. A lot of the cut flowers we get in the United States are grown hydroponically. A lot of the ones that we see around Valentine's Day are grown hydroponically in South America. Uh, a lot of people are getting into hydroponics. It's interesting. It's a little bit more of a challenge in some ways than uh, growing in the backyard. And for some people, they just don't have the space to grow outside, but they can grow inside. We see more and more schools having hydroponic systems. It's used in research quite a bit, again, because you can control the input, you can control the environment much more. And it is used in the production of illegal or previously illegal plants. A lot of hydroponics that were done in the 70s and the 80s elicit marijuana growers who were growing inside. I have yet to see now that hemp is legal and hemp is for those of you who don't know, is basically marijuana with less of the psychoactive THC in it. Now that hemp is legal in Virginia, I have not seen a lot of hydroponic hemp grown. I have seen a lot of greenhouse growing, but not hydroponics just yet. So what kind of plants can we grow? Pretty much anything. Um, lettuce, herbs, leafy greens, uh, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, other small squashes, cut flowers. It really depends on the market value. From a, from a commercial standpoint, a greenhouse is a huge investment. And so in an ideal world, you wanna be growing something that gets you a high return on investment. And so usually with hydroponics, we're talking higher value products on a commercial level. On a home level, you can grow pretty much anything you want within reason, as long as you provide structure for it. And so if we look at some of these pictures, we've got several things of tomatoes. Strawberries we have over here, strawberries are one of the crops that do really well in hydroponics. And we see a lot of hydroponic strawberries. Tulips, I think that's from Iowa State. Um, lettuce, of course, lettuce is probably the easiest thing to grow. Uh, here we have cucumbers supported on a trellis. This picture, I can't tell exactly what that is, but again, it's a trellis. It might be tomatoes. It might be cucumbers. There are lots of ways that you can do hydroponics. And if you're a tinkerer, hydroponics is something that you might be interested in just because there are lots of ways that you can tinker the system and make something that works for you in your situation. So what does the home grower really need at the basic level? Well, you need some testing equipment. You need to be able to keep track of the pH. If the pH is wrong, then the plants aren't going to be taking up the nutrients. You need an electroconductivity meter. And the EC meter is basically used to make sure that you know about how much solution or how much nutrient solution is in with your water mix. And it tells you when you add, need to add more nutrients, basically. And then you need some place to grow. And again, it can be done in a basement. It can be done in your living room really want to. I actually went to, uh, there's a guy in Woodbridge who's doing some microgreens and his kitchen is all hydroponics and that's his production facility. If you have a backyard greenhouse, that's an option as well. Greenhouses are a little more complicated to deal with just because of some of the management and environmental controls, but you can do it pretty much anywhere. And there are actually some systems where you can do them outside. So what are the things we need to think about? Well, nutrients is one of them. Like all plants, you need to think about the nutrients. And in this case, you can, you can really spoon feed the nutrients um, and you can really fine tune some things. It's a little more on the advanced side of hydroponics, but nutrients can be really well fine tuned in a hydroponic system. Of course, water, 
you need air, you need circulation around the plant and circulation of, of air in the root zone. And a lot of times with hydroponics, this is where people run into trouble is they don't allow enough aeration of the root zone. If we look at the picture down in the, the bottom picture here, these are tomatoes that have been trellised. They're growing up along a wire and you can see they've removed the lower leaves and they've got good airflow through this, again, to keep disease pressure down. Of course, you need lighting and you need the appropriate space. So what kind of hydroponic systems are there? Well, there are a lot. And again, they can be very simple and they can be very complex. And so one type of hydroponic system is an open system, which is a drain to waste system. And that's fairly basic. And basically you're growing in substrate and we'll talk more about substrate later. And you're letting the water through and the water is, goes to waste. You're not recycling it. In a closed system, you're recycling it. And there are several different systems that use a closed system. Again, they're, some are a little more complex than others. These are the types of systems that we tend to see in uh, actual production for profit. But these are all systems that you can do as a hobbyist as well. And we'll talk about each of these. So open systems. A lot of times I ask people if they've ever done hydroponics. And quite honestly, if you've grown plants in a pot, you've done hydroponics. So hydroponics is all about not growing in soil. And a lot of times people confuse soil and potting mix. Potting mix is structure. It's not biology. It's not a living soil. It's just structure, substrate for the plant to grow in. And most of the time when we buy potting mix, it's usually peat-based. It may have some other things in it, but it's usually peat-based. And so that peat is not there for nutrition. It's not there for anything but to give the plant some structure for, to hold it in place and give the roots some structure. So if you've done potting mix in a pot, you've done an open system because you're not growing technically in soil, you're adding water, the water is going to waste. And when I say waste, that's anything that the plant doesn't uptake, the water is either gonna evaporate or go through the system. And so a lot of times we see that in seed starting and root cutting. A lot of times it's with media beds. Um, sometimes it's with containers with media in it. Uh, there are bag systems, which we'll take a look at later on. Bag systems can be used in closed systems and open systems. Potted plants, like I said, basically an open system. Aquaponics. Aquaponics is usually done in a closed system but it's also sometimes done in an open system. And aquaponics is basically adding typically fish, but it can be other aquatic life, mixing that into the, to the system to provide nutrients. And we'll talk more about aquaponics here in a few minutes. So like I said, lots of closed systems, uh, wick systems, which basically you've got a reservoir of water that's drawing up the water into the root zone. The deep water culture, which is basically our raft and float bed systems, one of the oldest types of hydroponics. Hydroponics basically date back to uh, Mesopotamia. So we're talking six, 7,000 years ago. The Aztecs around Mexico City, the lakes around Mexico City, there's still actually some open float water production there, but when the Spanish arrived, there were massive rafts of hydroponically grown crops in some of those lakes around uh, what is now Mexico City. There's nutrient film technique or NFT. This provides a continuous flow of nutrients and water. There's an ebb and flow system where you're alternating flooding and draining. As I said, aquaponics, you're coupling aquatic animals with plants. And the advantage there is the waste from those aquatic animals most of, if not all of, your nutrients that you add to the plants. And there's aeroponics, which is misting of the roots with a, a nutrient solution. It's kind of like ebb and flow, but instead of larger water droplets, we're talking about misting small water droplets, allowing that mist to cling to the roots. So again, wick system, fairly simple. Uh, most of the time when you see a wick system, for homeowners, it's gonna be a situation that looks like these tomatoes here on the right, where you've got some sort of tub, and usually 
Now in that picture, that's kind of a design your own one, but usually they're more, the commercial ones are gonna look something like this, where they've got a tube that you can add water to. A lot of times they're, they're sold as self-watering potting systems. And so you've got potting mix, and then you've got a basket of wicking material, the water, which has nutrient solution in it, gets drawn up into the root zone, and that's how you're feeding your, your plants. Really simple, really easy, basically one step up from a an open, just having the plant in pots. And of course you can do that with a 20 ounce soda bottle or a two liter bottle. A lot of times in schools, one of the first things we do is we have introduced kids to hydroponics using uh, a bottle system like we have shown here. Thomas, we have quite a few questions. You wanna take a pause? Sure, sure, let's answer okay. some questions. Is it budget friendly? Greenhouses and grow lights, are they pricey? Yeah, so budget wise, again, hydroponics is one of those things where you can spend a lot of money, but you can do it really simply. The WIC system, for example, really inexpensive. A lot of our hydroponic systems, you know, it, it also depends on whether you buy a kit or whether you do it yourself. A lot of times the kits that they sell are really expensive, but it's not really that difficult to mimic those kits doing it yourself. And as we get into some of the systems, you can see some of the materials that are being used. And um, we can talk a little bit about ways the do it yourself or can. And this picture of the WIC system is just a big Rubbermaid tub that somebody's done. And I can't see where the filter tube is, but basically there's probably a screen halfway down there where the water, whoops, where the water chamber is. This was probably done, I mean, to do something like this, you need some sort of aluminum screen, which again, depending on what you're using, probably isn't that expensive. A little PVC tube and that Rubbermaid style tub and then some staking, because this looks like it's tomatoes. That's a relatively cheap way to go. Question, Thomas. Um, sure. The main difference between hydroponics and aquaponics is the lack of fish? Yes. Okay. And we'll, and we'll look a little bit more on, on aquaponics towards the end. How about kale, mustard, and collards? We're going to talk about different things that you can grow, but all of the leafy greens do fairly well in aquaponic systems. I haven't seen collards grown commercially, but I have seen kale grown commercially. The Kratky method? Um, there was some question about whether anybody in the group does that. You can reply to Alan Byler on the chat if you use that system. I'm not sure what that grow system is. Grow light matter? Yeah, having, a, having the right grow light will matter. Just, just like if you're trying to grow inside in tubs, having a good grow light is important. What's nice is that we're starting to see some relatively inexpensive LED lights which lasts a lot longer than the fluorescents do. Yeah, Alan Byler on the chat says he uses 6,500K LEDs for the leafy vegetables and full spectrum for tomatoes and peppers. That's good information. Yeah. Can you and hydroponics in a fish tank without the fish? Yes, actually. Um, that actually brings us to this, the float bed system. So float beds are six to 12 inches deep. And you can do a float bed on top of your, uh, your fish tank. I used to be an agriculture teacher in high school and middle school. And one of the systems that we taught the kids to do, and we did it aquaponically because we had fish in the tank, but we could just as easily not have the fish in the tank and use a float bed system right on top. The one thing with, with float bed systems is you want the water to be moving a little bit and that goes to oxygenating the roots. It's important to realize, you know, when we're in school and go to science class and it's like, what are the functions of the roots to hold the plant and to take up nutrients? One of the things that they gets glossed over is depending on the plant, they do a fair amount of respiration. They, they do take some oxygen in. And so it's really important to have oxygen in the water. And so if it's a stagnant situation, it tends to not do, the plants tend not to do well and they tend to have root problems. 
And so like in a fish tank situation, all you would really need to, to be doing is, you know, as you typically would have the filter be running just to get some movement and some oxygen in that water. Here's another question. I've seen videos where people grow in mason jars. Is that an option? Yes, it is. And actually I'll show you a little bit of that in a, in a minute. I've seen, again, on a school situation where you're introducing kids to it, I've actually seen uh, people grow radishes in big gulp cups. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not the most ideal way to do it, but it, it can be done. So with a float bed system on a commercial level, basically you typically have a long tank and you're constantly starting and harvesting product. You've got them on floats. You can see here these little holes and this is where the plants go and you just kind of move them along it and space them out as they need to be. What's interesting about the float bed system is they can actually be used environmentally to clean up stormwater. There are what are referred to as floating wetlands that basically have plants that are put in either ponds or at, and sometimes lakes. Um, and the, the idea is to suck up excess nutrients and to help make the water cleaner. And I believe there are a couple of parks in Fairfax County that are using that system. So here's more float bed. This bottom center picture, this is actually from Australia, but this is a, this is a floating wetland. And again, it's there to try and clean up some of this water and make sure that nutrients coming off this cropland aren't getting into the waterway or getting taken out of the waterway after they get washed in there. These are more commercial style uh, float bed systems. And the float that they're using is just that dense styrofoam insulation panels. So again, not terribly pricey to do. Um, you can see in this one on the upper right, it's not necessarily super deep tank that you need, but you still get decent root mass. This is all, or mostly all bib lettuce. This is uh, over here in the lower left. This is Virginia State University, one of our partners in extension. And I believe it's tilapia tanks here. And the water from the tilapia is being filtered through here. It goes through this system and it's returned back and there's an underground pipe where there's a sump pump over here that pumps the water back into those tanks. And so it's sort of recirculating. It helps the fish because the plants are taking out nutrients, particularly ammonia from the fish waste. And so it's making a better situation for the fish, but it, it's also providing nutrients for that lettuce. Hey Thomas, there's a couple questions here about using high density polyethylene for containers? So I haven't seen anything about a problem with high density polyethylene. Part of it depends on how thick it is, um, just in terms of how long it will last. I want to think that, you know, if we go over to this picture in the lower left, those fish tanks, I want to think those are high density polyethylene tanks. You know, it's being used in fish culture, so it's not giving off chemicals that would be toxic to the fish or to the plants. If I remember correctly. And the wattage for um, for grow light, do you want one to control the color of the lights yourself or will you go into that later? That's a more advanced topic that we're not going to go okay. into, but there are lots of different ways that you can do the lighting. Typically you want cool light and warm light, so that full spectrum. The wattage varies. One of the things with using grow lights is that typically we want grow lights to be close to the top of plants. And so again, going back to lower left, we've got natural light coming in and so we're not really having problems with this. If this was a basement, we'd want those grow lights to be a couple inches off those plants in an ideal situation. So those plants are getting the maximum amount of light. If you've got too low a wattage or if they're too high above the plant, you end up with really leggy plants. Here's one other question about pH. Uh, the, the well water that they have is seven pH and uh, what is recommended, this is from Elizabeth, to bring down the pH and um, Charlie from the Hydro Farm says 5.5 to 6.5, is that what you would recommend? Most of our plants do best when you're looking at a soil pH of low to mid sixes. In a hydroponic situation, ideally mid five to mid six, 
you can go to seven. I've seen some places where seven is fine. It's important to, to remember that plants have an ideal, an okay, and a dangerous range. What may be ideal, so maybe the 6.5 6 is, is typically ideal for tomatoes. Most of our other vegetables, 6.3 is ideal. And so the farther you get away from that, the less ideal it is, the less efficient the plants are at taking up the nutrients. Seven is not a problem in most cases. Most of our plants can adapt to seven. It's when you start getting really low pH. And so one of the reasons why you want to monitor pH is that a lot of times the fertilizers we're using are in salt forms. And when you apply them, they're going to be changing the pH and lowering that pH. And so that's something to be aware of. And there are different things that we add to kind of balance that pH. So another closed system is NFT, again, nutrient film technique. And this is continuous flow. Basically, you're just pumping water and the water is, is rolling through the roots. Typically, this is done in channel, although you can do it in media beds. Um, and basically, you've got these channels that are holding the different plants. You can use all sorts of things for channels. A lot of times in schools, we use PVC pipes because they're cheap and easy to, to work with. Um, they're metal channel sort of situations. I've seen people do it in, uh, basically, a, they've gotten roofing gutters and use those for their system. There are some commercial outfits that make a gutter-like uh, situation, which in the upper right we have, this is in a school somewhere in the eastern part of the state. I can't remember which school it is. But um, these channels here are commercial. They're about half the, the depth of a typical gutter, but they're a bit wider. And they actually have special adapters that allow them to go into the round PVC. The big thing with an NFT system is you need to have a good frame and you need to take into account that you're going to have a lot of water and a lot of plant mass on that. I was at a school one time where uh, they had a catastrophic failure because the stand that they had their system on was not built for the amount of plants and water that they were going to have. And basically it fell apart in the middle of the night. <laughs> so you want to make sure your structure is, is good and solid. And a lot of times you're just using really one pump. Your water pump is, is pumping it out, it's running through the channel, and then it's just draining down. And typically on this, we want an air stone in there, again, to oxygenate. Although depending on the system, there are ways that you can use the returning water. You can oxygenate that using sort of trickle systems where they're trickling over things and gathering oxygen as they, they go along. NFT at its very simplest is growing in a jar. And this is um, bantam corn, which I don't recommend growing corn to maturity in a jar because it's just not going to work. This is a pint-sized mason jar that uh, last week I started some bantam corn, and you can see it kind of go the top left to right, and then it goes down, and then right to left on the bottom is kind of the progression. Um, and this is just pea gravel. Gravel is the medium. You've got water there. The downside about this is there's not a lot of flow, and so you can get stagnation, and that can cause root problems. As a matter of fact, I did this with corn, peas, and some nasturtium that I had. And the peas had all kinds of problems because the water got really stagnated and some of the peas started to rot. Again, this is your simplest form. And, and this is, is one that you have to be a little bit careful about when you're doing a, something in a jar. But like I said, small things can, you can grow in a jar. Again, you wouldn't do that with corn, but this is a good example of germination because corn germinates pretty quickly. Do you have to root the seedlings in soil and then move them to non-soil? No. In this example, so in the upper left, that's day one. We've got the corn seed up on top of the gravel. We flooded that. And then a couple days later, we've started to sprout. One of the problems with, the situ with a system in a jar is that the plants are going to use the nutrients, are going to use the moisture, and they're going to lower that water level. And so you're going to have to refill that. Um, and you're going to lose some to evaporation. So these were, just, these were just started on gravel. And I've done experiments with kids where, you know, they've got a Dixie cup and they're trying pea gravel, they're trying aquarium gravel, perlite, sand. And with all of those situations, you're just putting the, 
putting the seed on top and making sure it's flooded enough so it gets moist and you start getting root growth. It's fairly easy. Like I said, you can do something similar to this, like in a big gulp cup and, and grow a radish. I wouldn't recommend doing it in gravel because it, you'll have a very misformed radish, but basically you can use anything and you're, you're doing it directly. And we'll talk a little bit about in, with some of the other things when you're, you're putting them into other system, what you use to start the seeds. How about core as a growing medium? Coconut husk, yes. And actually I've got a whole section on different types of, of media. It's not exhaustive, but um, core is one of the things we discuss. Core can be a little bit pricey, but core still is, is a good choice. It's much more sustainable than peat. So again, where this is more of a NFT system on a commercial level, one of the things that you'll notice in this upper left, these squares, that, that looks like rock wool. Rock wool is one of the media that we grow, especially for smaller seeded stuff. And basically this acts as the substrate. The roots will grow through it. It's also will absorb moisture. So when the seed is just there on the top, the moisture will wick up and keep the seed moist. And so that's another medium that you can use. The other nice thing about NFT systems is that you can stack them in interesting ways to get more space. And again, here we have lettuce, and this is just on an A-frame, and you basically have got more space. This is allowing more light to reach here. This system, I believe this is at Virginia State. One other thing to note about this picture in the background, these tall plants, these are cucumbers, and they're in grow bags, which is another way that you can do hydroponics. Again, more NFT. Over here, again, going back to that seed starting question, that's rock wool. And again, I'll show you what rock wool looks like up close uh, in a little bit. And this is Oasis. And Oasis is kind of like if you've ever gotten a, a floral arrangement, it's that spongy brick that florists use to make sure that cut flowers get moisture and the, those arrangements last. So another way that you can do hydroponics is with ebb and flow. And basically you've got a big tank, it's on a timer. Every so often you're flooding your grow tray or media bed, and then you're letting it drain. And you just repeat that cycle. Depending on the plant, depending on the system, kind of depends on what that timing is. One pump, pumping it up, using gravity again, pull it down, you can add an air stone to it, you can have a trickle system that helps oxygenate the water. I think this is a little more complex than, than the NFT system just because you have to make sure the timing's right because the last thing you want is the roots to dry out. There are a lot of producers who prefer to do it this way as opposed to the flood system. And again, here are some examples of ebb and flow. So in the upper left, we've got tomatoes that every so often the timer goes off, those grow bags get flooded with water. This is actually an open kind of NFT or ebb and flow system because they're, uh, I believe in this particular photo, which is again from Virginia State, the water is not being returned, it's just going to waste. In the upper center, we've got a media bed that looks like pea gravel um, where they're growing lettuces. To the right of that, we've got bigger gravels. We also have these ceramic ceramic stones here. Uh, they're basically ceramic pellets that help with, with aeration. They're kind of expensive to use all by themselves. And so sometimes they just get added into uh, other things to increase the aeration and the drainage. Over here in the lower right, we've got, this is actually oat hulls. So when they're processing oats and they're separating out the grain from the hull, those hulls, we use oat hulls, rice hulls, peanut hulls. Um, they're all used or all can be used uh, in a hydroponic situation as a media bed. And so again, we're grow bags and these grow bags have just regular potting mix in it. And over here, this is again, a mix of gravel and those ceramic pellets. 
So here's a good time to talk about some of the growing substrates that you can use, and there are lots of them. Typically, we're looking at rock wool and oasis in a production situation. Although again, you've got different types of, of gravel and stone. You can do things in sand. You can do things in various hulls. You can do it in peat moss. You can do it in core. You can do it in, in perlite. Well, let me back up about perlite. Perlite, I wouldn't recommend doing 100% perlite, especially if you're doing a flood system because perlite is really, really light. Um, but usually perlite is mixed with vermiculite and either coconut core or peat moss. So rock wool. Um, so this kind of, I don't know, it reminds me of uh, fiberglass insulation. It's not fiberglass. It's sterile. It's inert. Typically, it's sold in one of these mats with a little dimple in it, and it comes in lots of different sizes, and it's basically melted basaltic rock and with chalk mixed in, um, and it gives really good root support. And these cubes are really handy because typically these trays fit in your normal uh, trays like you would have cell packs for starting vegetables. And so you can get the roots to, or you can get the seeds to germinate and then transfer them into your hydroponic system from there. You just break off the individual cubes and put them into the system. You do tend to have to soak these first just to make sure that the pH is, is where it needs to be. Oasis is very similar. Unlike what you get with floors, which are big kind of bricks, Oasis cubes are basically sold with the little dimple in it. It's sold in trays, just like the rock wool and, and in different sizes. You germinate typically out of the system and you can see the, the tray down here that they're germinating them in. And then they would get transferred into whatever system that you're using. It's foam. It's really good for seed. You can also use it with cuttings really well because rock wool, it's it's a little hard to kind of penetrate a cutting into it with Oasis because it's foam. It's really easy to, to stick something in it. Neutral pH it has a lot of water retention. And so a lot of people really like this, uh, particularly with seeds that tend to, to need a lot of water to germinate. And so another thing is the expanded clay pellets. These are really... They're useful, they give a lot of structure, not as good to start seeds in. They're very lightweight. The big problem that you have to be careful about is that a lot of times because they are clay, in getting bounced around in transport and storage, they'll have dust. And so you wanna rinse these before you use it to get all that dust out of there. Um, lots of pores for air really good drainage. They're reusable. You can, you can wash and sterilize them in a bleach solution. We don't use them in ebb and flow systems too much because they can dry out. Typically, we'll see them mixed with other medium just because they can be very pricey. And they're basically about the size of a marble. Core or coconut fiber, um, biodegradable, environmentally sustainable. pH is in the range that we want it to be. It's got really good water holding, holding capacity. You can get it in different sizes. A lot of times you can buy bricks. There are different grades of it. Uh, some are used for more landscaping and industrial uses and others are used for uh, actually as growing media. So you have to be careful of perlite. It's just expanded glass. You've seen this in potting mixes, no doubt. Um, it feels like styrofoam. It's easy to crush it in your fingers. Um, it's very porous. It gives good drainage. It gives good aeration. Again, the problem with using this all by itself is that it is just really lightweight. Um, I've seen in flood situations where the ebb and, and flow situations where somebody's done perlite and every time it floods, that perlite raises up. Sometimes that's a problem with young plants. Typically, it's mixed in about a third with other substrates. Vermiculite is another one that we tend not to use by itself. 
Um, vermiculite, we see a lot of times in potting mixes. It's got really good water retention. It helps with the capillary action to draw water up towards plant roots. But again, it's not something that you really want to use all by itself. Uh, having a lot of vermiculite though in a mix is, is good in wick situations because its ability to draw water upwards. There are all kinds of rocks that you can use. The smaller the rock, the more likely it is that you can use it for germinating seeds. Lava rock, river rock, you can technically use that, but it tends to be with larger plants and plants that have been established. Typically with something like that, you would be using that with um, maybe like a, an oasis foam where it started in and you'd place that oasis foam and put rock around it in a, in a media bed. You do need to clean rock before you use it. Rocks are relatively easy to clean and reuse. They're really inexpensive. One other downside to rocks is that they get heavy and depending on the situation, but especially in a greenhouse situation, the rocks can heat up and that's gonna raise the temperature of the nutrient solution. Sometimes that's gonna cause water to evaporate out. Sometimes it's gonna overheat the plants. So you do have to be a little bit careful with rock, um, particularly in a greenhouse situation. Inside, it's not as much of a problem. And then net pots, uh, a lot of times we use net pots as a holder for other substrate. You can pop rock wool in there, you can pop oasis in there, you can pot, pop potting mix in there, put gravel in there. Um, it can be used in most of the systems that are commercially available. You can get pots in a variety of sizes and it really allows that media to be uh, flooded really quickly and it allows you in some situations to use less media than you otherwise would. Thomas, there's a question about why clean, why do the rocks need to be cleaned? It has to do with a couple of things. One is dust that can get in the system and clog pumps. The other issue is depending on the source of the rock, um, you might want to just think about, you know, what other things could be in, in that rock, what bacteria or fungi that could be in, you know, in the crevices of the rock or on the surface of the rock that might not be great for your plants. So if we look at some of the systems, one of the systems that we can use is a container system where you're looking and where you're using whether they're grow bags or lay flat bags, which are similar to grow bags, or Dutch buckets, which is a, basically an, a drip system with either buckets or bags or pots. We see this used quite a bit in more production. We don't see it used too much on the home side, um, but you can, again, depending on your situation, depending on how you want to do things. Um, I've seen people use five gallon plastic bucket as their hydroponic container. Um, for plants that have more extensive root systems, this is a good option. And these can be drained to waste or they can be incorporated into a system where you're recycling the water. And so uh, in all these pictures are tomatoes. The one that's off by itself, this is a Dutch bucket sy system where you're basically using drip irrigation to feed these tomatoes. You've got a central line with drip coming off of it. Um, you're using a pump to kind of force it in there a little bit. Um, these are drained to waste. This is rice hulls in its grow bag on tomatoes. Um, and these are cherry tomatoes. This is a, an easy system to do. And again, this containers, we tend to use open systems, um, but it can be used in a closed system as well. So what can we grow? Um, on the practical side, Lettuce is probably the easiest thing to grow and there are a ton of lettuce varieties and most of them are well suited for hydroponics. The big thing is that you gotta think about spacing. There are some companies that specialize in developing varieties for hydroponics and you'd be surprised how much lettuce you find in the store that is not iceberg lettuce uh, that's grown hydroponically. And here in the county, I can't remember the name of the farm, but we do have a hydroponic lettuce farm in the western part of the county. And some of the varieties that do fairly well are Rex, Romaine, Oak Leaf, and Red Oak Leaf, Lola Rosa, Boston. Most of our loose leaf lettuces do really well. 
other sort of leafy sorts of things, um, all types of herbs. Typically our annual herbs do better. Um, leafy greens, endive, kale, pak choy, arugula, the mucilin mixes that you find, microgreens, lower left. This is a bunch of herbs on what I believe is an aeroponic system. Here we've got pak choy, this looks like kale. Down here we've got microgreens. Lots of leafy things are, are really tend to be fairly easy in hydroponic systems. When we move into vegetables, that's where things get a little more complex because we have to provide structure. And most of the time what we're looking at are peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, and smaller squashes. You can do other things. It just depends on how much effort you're willing to put into making sure there's enough support. You can also do small fruits. Strawberries, as I mentioned before, are very popular hydroponically, but we're also seeing more and more cane fruits, that is raspberries and blackberries, being used in greenhouses with hydroponic systems so that we've got good disease control and good use of water. And so those are options. And you remember I said something about making sure that when you're using lights, that they're fairly close to the plants that you're growing so they're not super leggy. Here we have in this upper right, we've got lights that have been added that are close, even though this is a greenhouse structure. It looks like this is winter time, which is why they've got the additional lights there. But those lights are low and close to the plants. And then you can do cut flowers. A lot of the roses we get for Valentine's Day are grown in South America in hydroponic systems. And that's what the picture on the left is. We see a lot of zinnia production in hydroponics. A lot of tulips are produced in hydroponics. And in this particular case over with these tulips, these trays have the media on the bottom, the bulbs are put on top, and then the tubes that you see are running the water to do ebb and flow. And then the water drains out the bottom of, of those trays into a return mechanism. So before we go further, questions? If you want to get started, what's the most efficient way to get started for, like if you want to grow for two, two to three families at once? Uh, probably, well, and it depends on what you're growing. So if we're talking vegetables, pots are cheaper than grow bags. Um, so you could do that. Basically that's kind of con container gardening is really kind of what you're looking at. Um, if you're talking big production, if you're doing it in pots, you can have a variety of, of vegetables fairly easily and it's not as much of a problem in terms of management. That's kind of a hard question to answer specifically uh, without knowing more details in terms of what they want to grow and what resources there are. But I'm happy to, to discuss that offline with whomever asked that question. When using pebbles to grow in mason jars, are you putting the seed inside to let it sprout or another watery medium and then planting it in the jar? No, it's just put it on top of the pebbles, flood the, the pebbles and make sure that the water is, is touching the seeds. There are many pricey cooling systems, but if you, oh, a cooling system that you recommend, we don't recommend specific. So with cooling, it really kind of depends again on your situation. So if you're in a greenhouse, um, mm -hmm. a lot of times the cooling that you have is venting and fanning. Sometimes you can use evaporation to help with that cooling. Otherwise it, you know, in an indoor situation, it's, it's air conditioning. Cooling usually is not a problem in an indoor situation. It is in greenhouses in the height of the summer, but a shade cloth will also work. But again, it, depending on what you're growing, um, a shade cloth may or may not be appropriate. Is plant spacing the same in hydroponics as it is in soil? Pretty much. You need to think about what is the mature size or what is the harvest size. So with these lettuces, you want them spaced so that it's going to be this size. You know that when you plant them, they're not going to be anywhere close to that. So that's what you, what you need to, to plan. A lot of times with float beds, it's a matter of measuring it out with uh, channels. Depending on the situation, you can actually plant them densely together and just move those individual, space those individual channels out as they get bigger. Yeah, so in a situation like this, these are actually spaced correctly, but because you can see in the mature size, they've got holes here. But if they weren't, if they were much closer together, you would just simply take a row out, 
to expand that distance and move it farther on the line. We see that a lot with the floating systems. So we're at 12 o'clock here, but I have one more question. Do peppers and tomatoes like warm environment and lettuce cool? Should the water be warmer for plants needing warmer environment? Um, no, the water can be about the same. It's, it's the air temperature that's, that's more an issue. And I'm happy to stay on to, a, to answer more questions. A couple other little things to think about, and this is just some, some basic management stuff to think about. Think about how you're going to grow. And like I said, Rockwell or Oasis is usually the best. You can use raw seed. You can get pelleted seed for small seed stuff that will help hold the moisture on too. Think about light. Think about trellising. If you're going to grow tomatoes, you're going to need trellising. If you're going to grow cu cucumbers, you're going to need trellising. Can you comment on pollination? Yes. So if you're growing inside and you are dealing with something that needs to be pollinated, you need to figure out how you're going to do that. Tomatoes in production situations, a lot of times by hand, they can do it with a brush and it's really easy to do it. Cucumbers are the same way. You can bring in bumblebees. Sometimes depending on the crop, you can use a, a low powered leaf blower. And then in this bottom picture, this is, this is actually, I forget what the actual tool name is, um, but for things that need to be kind of self-pollinated, um, but need the activity of bumblebees, this little thing, you stick in the flower and you hit, a, hit the bar and it vibrates like a bumblebee would to help get the pollen around. But if you're indoors and it's a fruiting plant, it needs to have some sort of pollination. Hydroponics can be management intensive. Things to think about are seeding, transplanting, harvesting, pruning, supporting fruiting plants, maintaining water quality, adjusting the nutrient solution, and scouting for problems. Also think about nutrition. Typically we're looking at complete fertilizer, which means it's got nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but we typically add calcium nitrate and magnesium sulfate into the system as well to help balance out the nutrients to balance out the pH. You really want to make sure you're keeping track of the pH with the pH meter, using electroconductivity meter to make sure that you have the right, the right amount of nutrients in your solution. Otherwise, your plants will be nutrient deficient. Try not to use chlorinated water. Chlorinated water is not the best thing to use for, for plants. Um, if you're using well water, that's usually not a problem. Um, if you have to use chlorinated water, um, it's a good idea to dechlorinate it first, and you can do that by letting the water stand for a couple days in the open. Um, a lot of times we do this in fish tanks where we fill it up with city water, and then we give it three or four days um, for the chlorine to evaporate out, and then we're ready to go. Just really quickly, again, aquaponics, we're adding fish to, this, to the situation. In most cases, it's tilapia, although you need a permit for that, so that's more on the commercial side. Bluegills actually work fairly well. The big thing to remember is that a lot of our fish species are warm weather fish. And if you're doing this, you need to make sure that in the winter that they are warm enough. And in this case, a lot of times you would probably need some sort of heat system for the water, depending on your particular situation. A lot of people are doing it, especially on a small scale. This is easy to do on a small scale. It's a lot more complex, quite honestly, on a larger scale. You can do this with tropical fish. Um, I've done it with tropical fish. I've done it with crayfish. I've done it with um, minnows. I've done it with tilapia. I've done it with pass. Um, I've seen it done with catfish, but it doesn't usually work quite as well with catfish, um, largely because catfish are bottom feeders and it you can sometimes get too much feed in the system and it, then you have some nutrient problems on the fish side, but fairly easy. The most complex is probably an aeroponic system, which is misting system. The towers that you see here are from the University of Georgia's dining hall. We have these tower systems in several of the Prince William County schools. They're simple, they're easy, they're expensive. And there's some tabletop versions. Okay, guys, that was the end of the video. Give me a second to close out of that. Um, okay, so what? Stop presenting. Don't want to do that. Okay, there's just 
some quick things I want to touch on after the video. Hey, hey. So the cracking method, um, they they briefly touched on it in the post edit um, subtitles. Um, they didn't touch too highly on it, so I just wanted to quickly go over that. Um, they do say that um, when they were talking about the corn, it's pretty much the cranky, cracky, cranky, cracky method. Yeah, they. <laughs> I see Valerie giving me a nod in the corner there. Um, they say that the when they were explaining the corn, um, that's mostly the, what the cracky method is it's um over not necessarily over watering your seed but um giving it a lot of water and then just letting the water evaporate over time and it should keep the roots um moist it should it should um make the plants grow um i just also wanted to give you guys some um, store hydroponic pot examples. Um, they do show, they do talk about um, very cheap ones that you can make with water bottles. Um, but I also want to show you guys how wide the range is. So if you are going to go shopping for some pot, for some like already pre done hydroponic pots, um, do look around because like some stuff is $35 and some are upwards of $100. Um, Valerie, do you have any like any more hydroponic notes or would you care for me to go into announcements? Um, no, so we don't have any materials in our catalog um, specifically about hydroponics. However, I think that the video today gave a lot of really great information about it, and it really just showed how you really don't need to start at the highest level of hydroponics with like the several hundred dollar kits. Um, it's a great way to um, get your foot in the door, but um, there are some resources out there that um, touch briefly on hydroponics um, in a larger sect of things like greenhouses and indoor gardening that you can check out as well. But other than that, I think you are uh, good to go, Casey. Okay, so I just want to reiterate again um, that we have had the recyclable container gardening starter kits restocked. Um, they contain three toilet paper rolls, three manage milk cartons, roughly a gallon of dirt, um, instructions on how to make recyclable pots and flyers for our future classes. Um, I've been receiving good feedback about the, about how effective the recyclable, um, containers are. So I highly suggest getting some. Um, these are first come first serve basis. Right as you walk into the Mass Park Library, you will, you can ask Valerie, you can ask any of the staff members where they are and they will show you where where it is. Um, Q&A in closing. Um, thank you all for coming to our seventh gardening workshop. Uh, if you do have any questions, you can email the Master Gardeners. Um, our next workshop is going to be from Scraps to New Veggies. Um, for, for Juneteenth, um, we are just, we are not going to be having a live class. We are just going to be up we're just going to be putting onto YouTube a pre-recorded class. Um, I also wanted to um, say if there's some stuff we didn't touch on here, um, we're having a Hydrophonics 2 class on July 31st. So just if you want to learn more about hydroponics, if there's some stuff that we didn't touch on that you feel should have been touched on, it's probably going to be touched on during that class. Um, and yeah. Valerie, if you have any final remarks or announcements, um, go on ahead. If not, I think that is class time for the day. Nope, that's it. I'm good for me. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and it can be found on our YouTube and our uh, website as well. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, guys.